1 through 9. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And I ask that when you find that, if you would not mind standing with me to honor God and His Word this morning. Our text is Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Quick question before we get into the text, though. How many of you are planning to take a nap immediately after lunch? That's right. Look at that. Almost, it's almost unanimous. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Beginning in verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, and that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We know that it will not return void. I pray now, Lord, that you would just take me and use me as a vessel through which you build this church, through which you uh, grow us in our spiritual maturity, in our love and devotion to you. We give our time to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, most often, um, when Tina and I get the opportunity, uh, when we go into town, when we go into the city, we like to visit the Christian bookstore. You know, there's Mardell, and there's also Lifeway in Oklahoma City, and we've yet to make it to Wichita, but I hear there's a Mardell up there. When we get the chance, we like to go to the Christian bookstore, we may not really be looking for anything, but we like to browse. We like to see what there is available. Uh, window shopping is what it used to be called. Y'all remember when you know people would go window shopping? And we'd go into the store. We'll look through the music. We'll look through the Bibles. And then we spend quite a bit of time looking over the book section because the books to me are the most interesting part. Most of the books, they claim to advance some knowledge of Christ. They claim to advance some knowledge of Christ. They claim to be something that's going to build the body and build the believers. But honestly, of all the Christian books that, that you may find in the Christian bookstore, I would venture to guess that less than 10% contain a simple presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The truth is, in this age, many Christians and churches have gotten off message when it comes to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are whole denominations. Whole church groups, churches, Christians, and they have exchanged the gospel of the grace of God for some graceless legalism or new age shamanism or just plain old secular humanism. And with the onslaught of ecumenism, and ecumenism is the call for all the churches, all the denominations, all religions to unite under the, the banner of social justice. With the onslaught of ecumenism... There is this temptation and there is this danger to biblically solid New Testament churches. And the temptation is this, to compromise our biblical convictions to cooperate with some religious group or some religious organization which is not Christian. And in so doing, we lend some measure of legitimization to their cause. But there are certain doctrines... Certain doctrines, certain Bible teachings we hold as essential to the faith, we hold as being essential to being biblically sound doctrines on which we cannot compromise, folks. Amen. Amen. Biblical doctrines that clearly define who Jesus Christ is. Biblical doctrines that clearly define the how and why behind the ordinances of the church. Doctrines that are essential to correctly proclaiming the gospel message which is uh, the message of salvation, which is this, that salvation is found in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Life alone. There's a dangerous, dangerous mood in the world today. There is a dangerous, dangerous spiritual atmosphere in this age in which we live. Amen. 
And it has as its banner tolerance and compromise. The Lord Jesus, when he sent his message to the church at Philadelphia in, in Revelation chapter 3, he said, listen, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the whole world. The hour of temptation. What is the hour of temptation that's going to come upon the whole uh, uh, world? Matthew chapter 24 and verse 5, the Lord Jesus said this, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And that means that the end of the age is going to be a time of, of great deception, folks. It's going to be a time when many people are going to fall prey to errant teachings, false False gospels and, and antichrist. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 25. The Lord Jesus gives us clear warning. If any man shall say unto you. Lo here is Christ or there believe it not. For there shall rise false Christ. And false prophets. And there shall great signs and wonders. Insomuch that if it were possible. They shall believe the, deceive the very elect. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Uh, the hour of temptation, in this hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world, what is this temptation? It is the temptation to align ourselves with false teachers, false prophets, and antichrist. That's the temptation, to compromise our convictions under the banner of tolerance and to align ourselves with false teachers, false prophets, and antichrist. The temptation in the last age is the temptation to listen, go off message, and take part in the plan and in the program of the Antichrist. And so it's for this reason that the uh, New Testament church, that is the Bible-believing, gospel-preaching New Testament church, has to strive to keep on message. There are too, too, too many distractions out there that can lead us off message and off course and off track. The world is going the way of the Antichrist. Get that settled. I heard this preacher say that one of his congregants came to him. She was bewildered, visibly shaken, highly concerned about the events of our day. And she said, preacher, it looks like the Antichrist coming is near. Everything is leading up to Armageddon. Whatever shall we do? And I like what he had to say. I like his reply. Not only was it accurate, but it was pertinent. You know what he said? Everything has always been leading up to the Antichrist and Armageddon. Amen. That's the direction we've been going all along. The world is going the way of the Antichrist. And, and the sad thing is that there are churches out there, or entities that call themselves churches, they're getting in lockstep with his agenda. They're surrendering the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and they're leaving behind the message of the cross. But listen, a great church is one that stays on message. So then, this third ingredient in a great church, as we continue in our sermon series, the ingredients of a great church, the third ingredient of a great church is this. Stay on message. Amen. Stay on message. So we have committed Christians, then we have the Word of God, and then the third ingredient, stay on message. Now the churches that were in Galatia fell victim to false teachers, and so the Apostle Paul wrote the letter of Galatians, to combat the false teachings that were making their way into the church. That's what we have in the letter of Galatians. A letter written to confront false teaching that was making its way into the church. And it's through Paul's letter, listen, which is God's word to us. Paul may have wrote it, but God inspired it. Through Paul's letter, we can learn how to keep from being victimized by the enemies of the cross, folks. Through Paul's letter, it's how, uh, through the letter to the Galatians, we can learn to stay on message, which is why we read it to begin the message this morning. And right away, in our text, in verses 3 through 5, we find the gospel message simply stated, very clear, clearly put forward in verses 3 through 5. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, listen, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There it is, simply stated, the gospel message. Amen. Amen. These three verses present 
the gospel in a very succinct way. Listen, it is according to the grace of God the Father, God our Father, it's according to the grace of God our Father that our Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil world, which is according to the will of God, to whom all glory belongs to forever and ever. Amen. Salvation, first off, is according to the grace of God. Amen. Salvation is according to the grace of God. There are no works on the part of man involved whatsoever. Salvation is according to the grace of God. And salvation is found in the person of Jesus Christ alone. The Lord Jesus secured salvation for us by his vicarious suffering on the cross. By his death on the cross. He shed his blood on the cross for us. He died on the cross in our place for our sins so that we would not have to suffer the wrath of God. Amen. Now listen, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cover the sins of all mankind in all the world throughout all of time. One drop of blood is sufficient. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And that means that the Lord Jesus in no way needs our help to save us. He doesn't need our help to save us. His sacrifice is completely adequate to atone for our sins. Get that. Okay? And he has all power and authority. He says that in Matthew 28 and 18. He has all power and authority. And because of such, he is able to impart eternal life to all who will call upon his name. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help in the least little bit. Salvation is according to grace by faith. Now, faith is not a work on our part. Faith is, is not works. Faith is absolutely contrary to works. Faith is the genuine belief in Jesus Christ that expresses itself in how we live. Now listen, this isn't easy to explain. Faith is not something easy to explain. But I'm going to say this, and those who believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to know what I'm talking about. A person who lives by faith in Jesus understands the nature of genuine faith. So you don't have to work at having faith when you know the Lord Jesus. Amen. You don't have to work at having faith when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Okay? Either it's there or it's not. Now listen, it can start out very small, like say the size of a, size of a mustard seed. It can start out very small, but it grows. And it grows. Yeah. And it grows. Hallelujah. It is the firm assurance that, that God exists. It is the firm assurance that God is and that he is going to reward everyone that is seeking him. Amen. So then, here again is the gospel message in its simplest form. Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, our Messiah, died on the cross to deliver us from sin. And anyone who puts their faith in him by calling on his name through prayer will be saved. That's it. That's the message right there. Amen. Jesus died in our place on the cross. He came out of the grave three days later. He is alive. He is risen. And all who put their faith in him, he imparts eternal life right at the moment you put your faith in. Okay? Not complicated at all. And it would seem very difficult to confuse, but there are people who get confused, do they not? Well, rather, there are people who are trying to confuse the message. Amen. For some reason, people want to make the gospel more <laughs> difficult than it has to be, more difficult than it really is. There are people, they want to make additions, they want to add conditions, uh, they want to change the simple message of the gospel. And that's what's happening in the churches of Galatia when Paul writes this letter. There were some men who came down from Jerusalem and they were preaching a gospel of works. They were Judaizers. They preached that a man must be circumcised in addition to holding faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. They said, it's all well and good that you have the message of Jesus, but you haven't got the entire message. No, no, you must, uh, you must keep kosher and be circumcised before you're actually saved. That's what they were doing. <clears throat> so Paul addresses this issue in verses 6 and 7. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. 
So these, these Judaizers came preaching, and there were people who were giving heed to what they were saying in the church. They added the work of circumcision to the gospel message of, uh, of uh, salvation by grace through faith. And so Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. And so Paul, when he hears the report coming out of the churches of Galatia that people are leaving the grace of Christ for some uh, uh, legalism, he's incredulous. And he wants to know how it is the Christians in Galatia are so easily swayed by these graceless preachers of works. And, and, you know, reading this and thinking about the situation, I think I'm right there with Paul on this one. You know, I, I think about Christians and Christianity and so how, how easily swayed. I mean, why does it seem like the elect? Why does it seem like people who are, are Christians go to church regularly? Why does it seem like they are so easily impressed when people come preaching some, some new doctrine, some legalism, some graceless legalism? Why is it the church gets overly impressed with these people? Why does it seem like people in the church are the easiest targets in the world for the cults that are out there? I know that there are saints who read their Bibles. I know there are saints who can spot a false prophet when they see one in the church. But listen, Jim Jones, everyone know who Jim Jones was? You heard of the guy in a tragedy? Maybe some of you are too young for that. Jim Jones grew his cult in a mainline denomination church. Vernon Howell. How many of you know who Vernon Howell is? Also known as David Koresh, the Branch Davidians down in Waco, Texas. Now, I know you remember that one. He built up his following through the Seventh-day Adventist church, which is considered mainstream, although that's debatable. The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses mainly target Christians in all of their uh, evangelistic work. And so I have to wonder, right along with the Apostle Paul, why is it that church people seem to move away from the gospel of God's grace so easily? Why do people accept legalism or shamanism or, or Wicca or secular humanism dressed up as something Christian just because someone comes claiming to be a Christian, just because someone is claiming to Christ, uh, teach Christian doctrines, that doesn't mean it's true. That doesn't make it so. And I believe... That the reason why people are so easily led astray is because we live in an age of theologically lazy Christians. Theologically lazy Christians. That, that, that is believers who never take the time to ever read or study the word of God. It sounds silly, I know, but it's true nonetheless. Men, there are men and women uh, in the church who are going to let others do all their studying for them. Theologically lazy Christians. They receive instruction from others. They never bother to check them out. They're not like the Bereans who were more noble and, and searched the scriptures to see whether those things that we were teaching were true or not. No, no. They receive instruction from people. They're willing to let others do their studying for them. And they receive everything as if it's the word of God. And they don't really know if someone is teaching them the word of God or not because they don't know the word of God. Theologically lazy Christians. But here at the First Baptist Church of Newkirk, we emphasize personal knowledge of the scriptures. We encourage everyone to bring your Bible to church with you. I encourage you, open that Bible. It's why we quote the text before we even get into the message. Open that Bible, follow along as the message is being preached. Amen. That way, I'm not up here saying, take my word for it. You can see it for yourself. You can read it for yourself. But theologically lazy Christians, they accept anything as long as it sounds good. They accept anything because they don't know. And so if it sounds good, they're going to hold it as, as, as biblical doctrine. I went to, um, there's a bird in the back. <laughs> I graduated from the American Christian College and Seminary in Oklahoma City, which is a Bible college. Non-denominational, so we had many different uh, professors from different denominations. I like that situation. I like that. I think that uh, uh, an intersection of ideas is good. I had a class that I had to take. It was required. It was called personal health. Trust me. I did not want to take this class. I pleaded with my counselors and my registrar. Is there any way I could avoid this class? I said, I go outside and, and take a beat rather than take this class. You see? That's a joke. No one laughed. 
I had to take this class, personal health. And the instructor, her name was Charlotte Esco, fine lady. Uh, one of the nicest people you've ever met. Of the charismatic persuasion. And uh, we're having a class, and she's teaching on sickness and illness and poor health. And she starts the class by saying, all sickness, all illness, all poor health has to do with sin. Now, that is a theologically sound statement, because if you go back far enough, you see that we didn't deal with the things we're dealing with until after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. So, but then she moves on and she says, now, if you're struggling with some physical malady, if you're struggling with some sickness or disease, it's because you've got some unconfessed sin in your life. Now, that's where the train went off the tracks. Because that's not biblical. You recall the incident where Jesus is coming away from a crowd of people who wanted to stone him. And there's a man who was blind, and he comes up to this man, and the disciples say, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And he said, neither, but his situation was such so that the glory of God might be revealed in him. Amen. That's right. Amen. So if you're struggling with some physical ailment or malady, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, it may be due to some sin, it may not. But what it is for, if you're a Christian, is for the glory of God. Okay? So she's teaching this class, and it's over. I get up, and I leave, and I'm outside, and I'm standing right outside the doorway, and there are two ladies who had sat through the class and were sitting in the back, and, and I overheard their conversation. I wasn't, like, leaning in or nothing. I was just standing in the hallway, and I happened to hear them talking. And one of them says to the other one, is any of that biblical? And the other one says, I don't know if it's biblical or not, but it sure sounds biblical. You can make anything sound biblical. Just add some King James language to it. And that's the point. Theologically lazy Christians don't know. They don't know. They claim to believe the Bible, but they don't know a word of it. And, and, and these people, these are the people in the church who are soon easily swayed by some other gospel. These are ones who, who fall out of the church fastest and align themselves with cults. Because they don't know the word of God. They are easily swayed by another gospel. But as we see in verse 7, it's really not another gospel. Paul writes, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's a very interesting statement by Paul, isn't it? He says, uh, they come preaching another gospel, which is not another. And it's really, uh, it loses something in the translation. In the Greek, the word is alos, which means another of the same kind. So basically what's happening is these people came in preaching works to these believers, and they were claiming that the gospel they were presenting, it was just more of the same message that they'd already received. So what they were saying is, we've got more to add what you already received. It's not different. It's more of what you need to know. Another of the same kind. They were claiming that their message was exactly the same as the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you find this uh, in the world today. You know, I imagine here that maybe these Judaizers came in and they claimed, as they brought their message from some other book in the Bible, they claimed that their book was just another testament of Jesus Christ, another of the same kind. Or maybe they claimed that uh, they had to uh, uh, rewrite the Bible. Uh, they had a new translation of the Bible. It was a revision. It was a necessary upgrade from all the previous works because all the other translations that we have are only necessary because uh, uh, the, all the other translations are all badly mishandled so that the Word of God was actually lost. And so what we've got now is we've gotten back to the original while all the others have gone the wrong way. Now, folks, these are the arguments that the cults put out there. This is what the cults say when it comes to the message. They say, well, this is just another testament of Jesus Christ. Well, our Bible is different because yours is so badly interpreted, you need to have the true word of God. Okay? Whatever the case may be, what they claimed was that their message was really no different than what believers had already received, what, what believers were already walking in. Uh, but the truth is, it was very different. Because Paul says, it's not another of the same kind. He says it's different altogether. And that's what you need to realize when it comes to the false teachers and preachers who try to come in the church promoting some other gospel. You need to examine it against the word of God to see whether or not their claims are true. Are they just trying to teach the Bible more thoroughly or do they have another gospel they're presenting altogether? 
And, and what is more, the false teacher's motivation is to trouble the church. People say, uh, excuse me, Paul says, but there may be some that trouble you. Now listen, don't miss this. People who come to church and introduce corrupt doctrines, they are not friends of the church. They're troublemakers. That's what Paul says. But there be some that trouble you. Someone who diverts people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ is not looking out for that person's best interest. False teachers are not poor, misguided seekers whose intentions are good. That's the way some people want to present them. Well, we know he's got some strange ideas there. But you know, really, his heart's in the right place. Not if he's leading people away from Jesus. It's not. Amen. Well, that was a good place for an amen. Amen. Preacher, sometimes you just got to amen yourself, right? They're troublemakers. They're from the enemy's camp. The Lord Jesus called them wolves in sheep clothing. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They bring disruption. They bring destruction. They are troublemakers. They're nothing but trouble. And outwardly, they may even appear to be angels of light. Outwardly, they may seem to exemplify Christian piety. Uh, they'll have a firm grasp on Christian culture. They'll have a firm grasp on Christian language. Uh, they will talk about grace. They will talk about atonement. They may even affirm that they believe Jesus to be the only begotten Son of God. They may profess a belief that Jesus was crucified and even resurrected, but they changed the message in there somewhere. They deviate from the message, and it's often just a little bit, just a little bit. False, uh, false teachers and preachers, they look and act like God's messengers, but they pervert the gospel. Listen to what it says in verse 7. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And in Paul's day, it was these legalists, these Judaizers. They wanted to add circumcision to the message of God's grace. They came in. Teaching works instead of grace and faith. In our day, it's the very same. They haven't gone anywhere. We still have legalists. They just, they just changed their, their mode of operation a little bit. But they're still preaching the same thing. There are some church groups that say, well, you're not really saved until you're baptized. And so they add baptism, the work of baptism to faith. Mark it down. It just works, folks. And then there are some that say, well, listen, you've got to maintain good works to maintain your salvation. You're not really saved unless you go out and do good works. Without good works, you're not saved. And they just add the work of works to the gospel message of salvation by grace. And there are some that say, well, how could you ever consider yourself saved if you don't honor the Sabbath day? You worship on Sunday. You're supposed to worship on the Sabbath. If you don't worship on the Sabbath, how could you possibly be saved? I'll tell you how. Because I'm in Christ. Christ kept the Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath day of Christ. Amen. Adding works. I heard a report about a young lady. She went forward during a revival service. Went forward and said, I, I need to be saved. I want to be saved. And so they, they set her aside and, and they began to tell her, here's how it is that you're saved. You can't be saved until you speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. Works. Mark it down. It's just works. Just change the gospel message just a little bit. Change the simple gospel message of salvation through faith by the grace of Jesus Christ. You change it just a little bit. Listen, you're no longer preaching the gospel. Change the message just a little bit. You're not leading people to salvation in Christ. You're leading them away. You change the message, you're undermining the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're leading people away from Christ. And that's why it's absolutely imperative that we've got to stay on the message. Amen. Amen. False teachers, false prophets, and antichrists are more dangerous, more dangerous than those who would openly defy Christ. Because false teachers and false prophets, they give the appearance of leading people to Christ when in fact they are building up barriers to people's faith in Christ. They're destroying people. It's such a serious issue that the Apostle Paul gives this warning, this directive in verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Amen. This is so eternally serious. The Apostle Paul reiterates this very thing in verse 9. As I said before, 
So say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. This is serious, folks, serious. We're not playing games here. This is the gospel of eternal salvation in Jesus Christ. People's eternity is at stake. This isn't some religious game we're playing. This isn't a social club. This is the body of Christ Amen. proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ so that men may repent and be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I've heard a lot about the Mormons. They have those commercials on TV, not so much anymore, but they used to. You know, they have some nice looking young man or young lady talking about mountain biking and surfing and things. And they'd say, well, I'm a surfer and I'm also a Mormon. You remember those commercials? And so I've been hearing a lot of good things about Mormons. You know, they're really nice people. And they are. I mean, I had a, uh, when I lived in Wisconsin, my landlord was an elder in the Mormon church. One of the nicest persons that I have ever met. And uh, his family were always pleasant and engaging. They would go on vacations and he would ask us to, he owned rental property and he'd ask us to watch over it for him. And then we would keep his dog for him. And they went on vacation so much that, that they just had made this joke that we shared a pet. We had their dog more than they did. Nice people. Invited us to dinner at their house for which they went. We went. He had come over and had dinner with us. Nicest people you've ever met. And he and his family, pleasant and engaging. And he was always inviting me to go to church with him. But thankfully, as a pastor, I had a great excuse for not being able to do it. So why don't you come to church with me this Sunday, Pastor Chris? Well, you just answered your own question, Pastor Chris. He was always trying to convince me. That the Mormon church was not preaching a different gospel than I was preaching at Trinity Baptist there in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And he, there's this book that the Mormons have published. And he gave it to me. And the book is about how close the message of the Mormons and the message of the Southern Baptists really are. Read this book. You're going to see how close our messages are. Well, they may be close, Amen. Come on. but they're not the same. Amen. Now, here's the gospel of the Mormon church. According to their own book, 2 Nephi 25, 23. Don't worry about going and finding one. I don't encourage you to go and look it up. We labor diligently to write and to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. Now, listen, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. That sounds pretty close to what we preach, doesn't it? Well, we, we, we persuade our children and our brethren to believe in Christ and be reconciled for God, reconciled to God, for we know that it's by grace that we are saved. But then they add this, after all we can do. Let me see if I can uh, uh, restate it. Let me see if I can sum up Mormon doctrine for you this morning. Here's what they believe. We do what we can to secure our own salvation through good works. And that whatever we're lacking, then God makes up the rest. That's what they believe. Now here's the gospel according to the word of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9. For by grace you are saved through faith that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. Close but not quite the same. One message is works and the other one is grace. One message will lead you straight to hell. The other one will lead you straight to God. Amen. So the message the Mormons preach is not the same as the message we receive. And listen, don't you dare miss this this morning. Listen to what the Bible says. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Joseph Smith of the Mormons claimed to have received his message, the Book of Mormon, from what? An angel from heaven? Doesn't matter. His message is not the same as the one we have received from God. Let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Well, I don't really like that preacher. I don't care. That's what the Word of God says. And either you get right with the Word of God or get out because you're just playing games. It is the preponderance of all these other Gospels, which are 
uh, really no gospels at all that necessitates that we stay on message. It is the aberrations and abominations of the Christian scientists, which are neither Christian nor scientific, that we have to stay on message. It is the aberrations and abominations of the Jehovah's Witches, Witnesses, who are nothing more than false witnesses, who nothing, do nothing more than bear false witness, that we have got to stay on message. The cults call for us to stay on message. It's due to the great amount of what are claimed to be uh, new revelations and, and new doctrines and new denominations and new religions and, and new revisions and new Bible translations that, uh, that change the word that now, uh, more than ever, we've got to stay on message. And the message is salvation is found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Stay on message. The hour of temptation which is to come on all the earth, it's happening right now. It is the temptation to compromise our convictions and allow ourselves to fall victim to false prophets and false teachers and antichrist. So, so we cannot ally ourselves with just anyone, folks. We cannot ally ourselves with just anyone. We if we lend legitimacy to their teaching, if we lend legitimacy to their doctrines by hitching our team to their wagon, we're going to find ourselves duplicitous in the practice of leading people away from Christ. The Bible says, do not even wish them God's speed for so doing. You partake of their sinfulness. So when that Jehovah's false witness knocks on your door, don't even open it. You don't have to. That nice Mormon missionary on his bicycle? I heard a comedian say once, the government could save money if they just let the Mormons deliver the mail. <laughs> you don't have to open the door. You don't have to give heed to what they say. There are different denominations. There are different religions. There are different, uh, there, there, there's things that we divide ourselves up for a reason. And the reason is we don't agree. Do not be unequally yoked. We don't agree. There are different denominations, different religions for a reason, and that reason is not everybody is right. Not all roads uh, lead to God. Not everyone is doctrinally sound. All roads don't lead to heaven. All roads don't lead to God. Only Jesus, only Jesus leads to the Father. Only Jesus saves. And the New Testament church is the only one who's got that message. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There's only one way. Well, don't you, uh, don't, somebody would, might say, don't you feel like that's just a little narrow-minded to have only one way? Only one way is needed. There's only one cure for polio. I don't hear anyone complaining about that. Jesus is the only way, folks. And you can come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can be saved right now. Just repent. Amen. Turn away from your sin and turn to Christ. Put your faith in Jesus. All it takes is a prayer of faith lifted up. Today I, I got to speak to some of our children in our children's department. They were asking how many times do you need to be baptized? I said only once, but if it's for the right reason. And I told them that the right reason is you'd be saved by putting your faith and trust in Jesus and praying a prayer and asking him to come into your heart and save you. All it takes is a prayer of faith uh, lifted up. Remember the Lord Jesus, he doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your help. He has all power and authority. But if you want him to save you, if you want to be saved, you've got to be willing to ask. Amen. Let's have every head bowed, all eyes closed. It's a serious moment for some of folks, so don't be looking around. Let the Holy Spirit move. I just want to ask a few questions before we go into our time of invitation. I want you to ask yourself, why are you here today? What was it that prompted you to get up this morning, to get dressed, and to come to church? Why are you here? Are you here because of Religion is just what you've always done. Family tradition. Or are you here because 
You wanted to interact with God this morning. You wanted to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Are you here because you want to know God? Are you here because you want God to be active in your life? You want the Lord Jesus to be guiding you every step. And I want you to think about your disposition. What I mean is think about where you are in life today. And I want you to ask yourself this question. I want to ask you this question. If something were to happen, God forbid, and you were to die today, tomorrow, would you find yourself in heaven in the arms of God? Some of you can answer that question affirmatively. Yes, I know I'm saved. I know, I, I know the Lord Jesus. But some of you can't. Some of you don't know. Some of you hope, maybe, that you're saved. But you're not for sure. Do you know if you don't know, you can know for sure? Amen. Amen. And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart right now, and if you want to know for sure, if you want to be saved, if you just pray with me, I'll lead in prayer. You don't have to pray exactly what I pray, but if you will meet, if you will reach out to the Lord Jesus with all your heart, I promise you, he's faithful. He's going to reach down and save you this morning. Yes, yes, well, let's just pray together, right? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I know I've heard the gospel today. I know you are the way, the truth, and the life. So the best that I know how, I repent. Forgive me, Lord. Please save me. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. I pray that we will take it to heart. And now, Lord, in this time of invitation, glorify yourself by calling sons and daughters home to glory through salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me now? We're going to have our time of invitation.